Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. How you doing, Michael? I am doing super. Big show tonight. Big show. So much to talk about. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get the other stuff. Um, Look, I wanted to follow up to start not on the main topic, which is cryptocurrencies, Ethereum, blockchain, Bitcoin. Um, and I want to end with ICOs, actually, because they're important, they're growing, and they're just indicative of the way blockchain is actually going to be used. I think there's a lot of things that people do and don't know. And frankly, I'm not an expert on it, but I wanted to... I don't think it's that hard to understand, frankly. Right. Anyway, I wanted to follow. I wanted to follow up from something we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Somebody asked me, "What are your thoughts on the Blue Apron IPO, vis-a-vis -vis the Amazon and Whole Foods merger?" And I'm not sure that they're like completely related to each other, but I will. But I will say this actually. I think there is a market for these prepared food and delivered food and delivery stuff. I just don't think anyone's nailed it yet. And to be fair, I haven't been able to – so I understand Amazon and Whole Foods completely. We talked about this last week, two weeks ago, I think it was now. And I think if you listen to that episode, you'll see we kind of know what we're talking about. Blue Apron, though, is a different animal, I think, in the sense that we can surmise what it's like or we can talk to people in Connecticut who don't live near that many restaurants. Right? We, we live in big cities, so we forget what it's like to not have food available at all times and literally at all hours, right? So what does Blue Apron mean for people that live in a suburb or an exurb, an exurb in the United States, and they just want stuff delivered to their house every night, mm -hmm. and then they pair it with their kids? So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how this plays out over time. Um, but you know, as I like to say, I don't have a monopoly on the right idea. I'm not always right. I have opinions. I'm almost more interested in other people's opinions than I am in mine. But I think it's a good point for um, Francisco with Jojo to bring up, and that is. What does this IPO really mean? And I think the only way to really tell is not just, you know, what it does on its first day or what it does on its second day, but what it does over time and actually what raising this money does for this business. We know where Amazon Whole Foods is going, mm. or at least we think we know. But let's follow this Blue Apron IPO and let's see what happens. Right. Excellent. Just I, I'm not up on the Blue Apron IPO. Just to bring us up to speed. Yeah, I mean, this is you. We know what the Blue Apron business is, right? Yeah. I haven't followed so much. I haven't followed so much on what the IPO is going to be, but it's just another tech company that's going to go to the public markets, right? All these, all these companies, right, that are venture capital funded. The only way the VCs can actually make money is by having some sort of exit, and that exit's right. either a sale or an IPO, initial public offering. Yeah. And it's interesting to cover this today because we'll talk about an ICO, which is initial coin offering later. Um, but it's the only way for them to make money. And sometimes they rush these things. Um, and this has been going on forever. Right? So the Netscape IPO, which is, you know, who knows how many years ago, dog wow. years ago. Awesome. Um, but that was rushed to market too. I don't think Blue Apron is. I don't think it happens as much as it used to happen anymore just because the valuations seem to expand and more people are participating in the private markets than at any time in history. So, and there are secondary markets now for non-listed equity. Mm. But I think it's more bringing up this topic. Let's see what happens with this IPO, because frankly, we don't have enough information yet. But I do think it is something that will be interesting to watch, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis what happened with Amazon and Whole Foods, just how this offline, online business right. is going to get perpetuated, right? That, that I think, to me, is the most interesting part. Well, there's a rush, isn't there, to IPO, because maybe there's a small window where they can get the maximum valuation. I guess this is going to come across to our next conversation about ICOs, right? Yeah. That the investors, the initial investors are obviously aware that this ain't going to last forever, interest in this stock or this technology, right? So there's a rush to get things out. Like with Netscape, maybe they could have overdone it. They could have overcooked it and left it a bit longer, but they may have missed the boat. Somebody Dude. else may have come along and become the darling of Wall Street, right? Do you, do you know the story of the Netscape IPO? Have you did you read that book, The New New Thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know the full that. story. I mean, it's so long ago now. Refresh my mind. We're talking like last <laughs> millennium, like, right? I think this was before you were born, actually. So, <laughs> you know, it was Mark Andreessen was doing this while he was at the University of Illinois at, at Urbana, right? And they they built this company called Netscape, and who was it? Jim Barksdale, who just figured out that the internet was the new new thing, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, because Netscape was just increasing in value in the private market so much, Barksdale, I believe, 
who was a big angel investor back in the day, actually went out and ordered the single largest yacht ever purchased by an individual. Wow. And he had a $100 million bill coming. <laughs> he had to pay for his yacht. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> So this is the reason or one of the impetuses behind why the Netscape IPO happened. He needed the money. Right. Anyway. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Those crazy days. Are, are those crazy days coming back? I mean, is that what we're sort of seeing with the, the Bitcoin thing? Yeah. I mean, let's back up and talk a little bit about what is the blockchain first, if that's okay, right? Right. And let's move from block because blockchain is a very – it's a very simple concept it, to a certain extent um, that's implemented with very complex technology, right? So what is a blockchain? It's really just a distributed public ledger or a public database. And it keeps like an unchangeable and uneditable record of digital transactions. Think about it this way. Mm. When you log into your bank account, right? You're logging into JP Morgan or, you know, pick a, pick a bank name, MUFJ, whatever it is. And you're logging directly into their system. And it's really just your own records. You know, in the old days, it was balancing your checkbook. But today, you probably use some digital form of tracking your um, your own financial accounts. Mm -hmm. But it's really your say against their say. How much money you say you spent and how much money they say you took out of your account or deposited. Right? It's a pr their, their database is private. And what blockchain's basically done is it said, we're going to create a, a non-centralized ledger that's distributed everywhere and the people that manage it are the people that are mining that that are doing the verification right that's what mining is mm -hmm. unless i'm missing something and again i'm no expert on this but again i don't think it's that hard right so tons of anybody really can write something into the blockchain but for it to get verified it has to get verified by the miners and the miners run very sophisticated and also very expensive technology and sort of and very um like super applied mathematics to confirm and verify all the transactions that are in the blockchain. And once it's once that block gets created, you cannot go back and edit it. You can add another transaction that changes the entire ledger, but you can't go back and change that one once it's been verified and once the entire blockchain agrees that it's actually correct. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically the old-fashioned style of the old-fashioned ledger that you were talking about was a privately owned record right but now it's local. out in the public domain yeah yeah local and the implications of so and this blockchain was really written as a you know as a white paper and sort of a, an experiment by some unknown person actually to be fair unknown group of people mm -hmm. what was the guy's name nakamoto which frankly satoshi nakamoto whether he's real so, or not we don't know well also nakamoto like do you, you live in japan right uh, i lived in japan for 20 years i don't know anyone i know a lot of guys named satoshi Right. But that's like a made up Japanese name, isn't it? If there ever was one. <laughs> yeah. Like it sounds like a name that someone who's not Japanese would make up without knowing right, anything right. about Japan. But didn't they trace that? I mean, there was some sort of expose where they, I don't know if it was a, a Fox News thing where they found some guy in Australia who was sort of living out the back of some trailer. Yeah. He wasn't Japanese. <laughs> no. And he wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto either. It's all, it reminds me of the Lindbergh baby, which is, again, probably way too long ago for anybody to remember. But you know, everybody wanted to be the Lindbergh baby. Nobody really was. And I think this Nakamoto thing is the same thing. But anyway, the point is that just like everything else, what he, what he or what they built, this blockchain, very sophisticated sort of proof of concept. And, you know, Bitcoin was this sort of single use thing that was built on top of it. Right, so the blockchain itself was not necessarily built for financial reasons. It was just built as a public ledger. And, you know, you can argue about whether this is for anachronistic. I don't even know if that's a word reasons. Right. right? This is why, like, cryptocurrency just means, like, highly technologized currency. I don't think it has anything to do with dark arts or anything like that. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But the point is that what people realized was instead of me, if I want to send you money, taking money out of my account and transferring it to your account, which means taking it off of one database, sending it to another database and hoping that it's okay. It just means that I can take Bitcoin, which was built on top of the blockchain. It's one of the first applications built on top of it. And it says, I've now transferred value to you. Hmm. And the blockchain verifies it. But so you've heard about, and, and the blockchain has problems, right? The original blockchain has problems, frankly, because it wasn't built for its current use case. 
It definitely didn't anticipate it growing this fast and growing this wide, for sure, particularly in the currency space. Yeah. But building a blockchain is now a well-known thing, and there are other people out there trying to build other blockchains from scratch, and we can talk about that in a second, right? Um, but the idea is that it disintermediates a lot of the middlemen for a lot of transactions. And because it's a public ledger, nobody really controls it. So your bank can't say to you, sorry, I've put a hold on those funds, or you don't have as much money as you think you have, or you don't have as much anything as you think you have. We'll get to that in a little later, right, when we start talking about Ethereum. But the point is that the blockchain basically takes away central control of a database, a mm -hmm. huge public ledger, right, and a huge distributed ledger and says, okay, if it's confirmed, it's confirmed, it is true. And every, it's almost like crowdsourced truth and approval. Right. right. You see, and we'll, and later when we get to these ICOs, it's called crowd selling. Right. You're selling coins and tokens, and we'll see what that means and how people are using it. But anyway, that's what that's kind of what the genesis or the beginning of the blockchain is. And essentially, what happened is, you know, the blockchain started getting used. And jump in when you you know when either I'm saying something that you think is out of school or when I'm not making the right um, logical jumps. <clears throat> but essentially, what happened back in what was it 2000 and 12? I can't remember exactly when Ethereum started. Was that? Oh, no, it was later, right? 2014. 15, 15, 15. Ethereum, right? Um, so Ethereum was basically a theory of like, okay, we understand now that the blockchain works, but let's rebuild it from scratch with more capacity, more throughput, faster transaction approvals. Yeah. You know, one of the things that the miners had to do in the original blockchain was it required a ton of electricity. But just a ton of electricity and a ton of processing power. And the biggest miners were those that had the most money because they could buy the fastest and best machines, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially what Ethereum said was, let's start from scratch. And they building their own blockchain, which was interesting in, in and of itself, right? And I think this is what happens with most, with, with most sort of technologies. Somebody builds something neat, they do a proof of concept, and then somebody else says, that was great, but actually let's build something now way bigger, way more robust, right. with more throughput that everybody can use. Right, because right. now they knew the actual use case, right? They could actually see how this could be applied, whereas Bitcoin was just a bit of an experiment, really, at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, and I mean, and, and Bitcoin is now kind of the base value for a lot of these other coins that get issued, right? In the same way that maybe the dollar is the global currency, Bitcoin is kind of developing into this thing where... There's a limited number of them now that can be produced. I think it's 21 million. I, I don't remember actually off the top of my head. But there's a limited number that can be mined just based on the mathematics that went around creating the original blockchain and the original Bitcoin implementation. And what a lot of these other currencies, these, these new cryptocurrencies are doing is they're basing their value on both the dollar and on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, the concept behind Ethereum was, and, and it's really, again, I keep using this word, but it's heavily nuanced, right? And Ethereum really, and their idea was, let's build a platform. You can see I love this already, but let's build a platform mm -hmm. where all contracts can be located on a blockchain. Same thing, because there are plenty of countries, localities, regions, where even just the ownership of property or the ownership of anything is not so straightforward. And what Ethereum wants to do is build this platform Right, this kind of decentralized and maybe the democratization, yeah. right, of this contract and ownership, and we can we can fast forward after after we talk about this a little bit to see what the implications of this are. But I think the implications are really wide. And before we get to that, before we get to like the differences between what Ethereum is and what they want to do, and what blockchain is, you really want to talk about what's going to make something um, ubiquitous. Right. In other words, what is out there that's similar to blockchain and how fast is it going to sort of not take over the world, but how fast is it going to be everywhere? And I think one of the I was reading this um, article in the Harvard Business Review, right, called The Truth About Blockchain. And I'm going to take some of the information from that because I think it's really useful and really important. And basically, the HBR said there are two things that sort of drive the acceptance of any new of any kind of new technology and whether it's going to be transformational. And the idea is that it has to be like, what's this concept of newness and novelty, right? So how, how new is it? 
and how new is the application of the technology? And we'll get to why Ethereum matters on this in a second, right? And the the newer, like less familiar it is, the harder the adoption is. And I think that's part of what's happening with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. I don't think most people understand what they what they mean and what they are. And so it's a perfect example of this, right? And then the complexity of its implementation. So how coordinated does it have to be for it to work? Mm. Right. In other words, and credit cards, which were from the 40s and 50s, were the perfect example of this. Right. So the diners club could issue a credit card. But if nobody took it or knew what to do with it, in other words, you could give a credit card to everybody. But if there was no way to process that, in other words, if the restaurant wasn't connected to the processing system, which wasn't co connected to the visa, which wasn't connected to the banks, then that credit card was completely useless. And we'll, we see some of this where I think there was a, a um, an experiment at MIT, and they basically gave $100 of Bitcoin to all the students. Something like 30% of the students didn't even go and get the free money. And the 70% did. Most of those students like took it and just turned it into dollars right away. Right. And the they reason don't why, trust it, right? It wasn't that they don't trust it. They just didn't know what to do with it, right? right. So I have $100 worth of Bitcoin, but... I can't even buy my buddy a beer with it. It's right. really, I think, or I cannot go get some clove cigarettes, I guess, is more <laughs> more common on university yeah. campuses. Yeah. I, I don't remember anymore. But this is the weak leak in the chain for the average person, right? Outside of the crypto community. Right. It's turning right. those Bitcoins into, dare I say it, real money. I know they'd hate to say that, but, you know, the fiat currencies, right? Yeah. Stuff you can actually buy your grocery shop with right or right, but you pay your rent right I, yeah i think that's part of the point though in other words if if you're domestic right so you're sitting there in japan and you have a hundred thousand yen you're not constantly trying to figure out what the value of that hundred thousand yen is because you know what it buys you frankly and whether there's inflation or deflation it's it's generally very um you know it's, it's a slow moving process right mm. and you always understand how much value you have but with Bitcoin, I think most people still don't understand, right? So it's very new. This is part of the novelty thing. And it also falls into complexity because you can't just go take Bitcoin out of an ATM and you can't go to 7-Eleven and spend it. And I think that's part of the problem with its adoption, right? Right. But the, the way that the Harvard Business Review explains this, and I think it's really useful, right, is something that most people still don't even know exists but is, is everywhere. And that's TCP IP. This is the protocol of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And they have they believe that the blockchain in all of its forms will kind of progress in the same way. And I just want to run through this because that'll get us back to what Ethereum is, I think, at some level. Right. So TCP IP, which is the protocol that the Internet was based on, was developed, what, in the 60s or early 70s, 1972? I can't remember exactly when it was. Right. But it was single use. And essentially what people used it for at the beginning was to just universities would send emails to other professors. Like so one professor at Harvard would send a email to a guy at Stanford. It was probably more like Stanford and Berkeley. But that was the type of use that was that it was for. Right. And then the next progression was something that they call localization. So it builds on top of that single use application. Right. So in this case, like what financial firms are doing. So you see Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, all kind of getting together and saying, how can we use blockchain to make make what we're doing more efficient? Right? And then there's substitution. And substitution is going to be something that's really important later. Right? So it builds on top of the single use and localization and says, how can we now do this and take an existing process that we know about and really like, right? And it's going to require much deeper coordination, kind of with the overall movement. And this is what Bitcoin, this is the sort of problem Bitcoin is having now, is that it requires sort of global coordination and massive um, ecosystem coordination. And that hasn't happened yet either, but that will happen. And we'll talk about later, like how Ethereum could potentially impact that and why this could take so long for mm. blockchain to really kind of take over in the same way that the internet did. I mean, TCIP apparently took 30 something years to become prevalent and ubiquitous, right? And then this transformation and that the idea there is how can like completely, how can this blockchain create completely new applications that literally change the fabric of society. So social things, economic things, and even entire political systems. And I think that's, we can talk about the contracts in the context of passports, right? Digital identity. And how like when you're born now, maybe you get a birth certificate, a social security number, but maybe when you're born later, you just 
get a block or someone on the blockchain just identifies you, which means that identity theft becomes almost impossible without the entire system verifying. It just makes travel and passporting and visas and all that stuff like really interesting to me. Mm. And this transformation thing is really the most interesting part about the blockchain. It's the most disruptive and potentially the most fearsome if it's not implemented in, I don't know what's the right word, in the most benign way and in a friendly way. And there are companies out there just trying to create kind of the whole blockchain plumbing, all the infrastructure on the blockchain. Chain.com actually is one of them. I spent some time listening to the founder talk. I can't remember his name. But again, what he's doing is just building the plumbing around around the blockchain. So very interesting stuff. Anyway, let's get back to um, Ethereum. So Ethereum figures that the entire world is contract-based, right? Whether it's money or house purchases or even your passport could be considered some kind of contract. And essentially what they want to do is they want to build the tools that allow people to use the Ethereum technology to build all these contracts, right? And they want to do it for companies, for individuals, and they have massive growth in their contracts with, with large IT companies. And it's probably super popular with like your technorati, I guess there's no other way to call it, right? Yeah. But the idea is that they, they, want, to, they want to have this goal, right, of using the blockchain to, re, to replace third parties. They want to take away the middleman in kind of all cases where contracts and that stored data that's associated with those contracts, like mortgages, we talked about this a little bit, and keep track of all that stuff in, this, in a distributed ledger that they manage. Now, one of the most interesting things about Ethereum is that they funded themselves in one of the, not earliest, but one of the most significant um, initial coin offerings, mm-hmm. right? So this is really interesting, right? So basically what they said was, instead of going out and raising venture capital money, they wanted to use Bitcoin as a way of funding themselves, but they also created their own coin. Right, so this concept of an ICO is actually really important to understand. Again, really simple, I think. And I want to read something because I think it's really important to see what this is. This is according to Wikipedia, right? An initial coin offering is a means of crowdfunding the release of a new currency. You can call it a cryptocurrency. It doesn't really matter, right? But unlike an IPO, here's where it's really cool. And this, we'll talk about this kind of at the end of, at the end of the show as well. But unlike an IPO, when a company issues stock, so an initial public stock offering, we usually leave out the S from that comment, right? Um, You own part of that company, right? So you own the returns of that company, you own the debt of that company, you own the dividends of that company, you own a piece of it. It might not be a big piece, but when you buy stock in that company, in the public markets, right, in that IPO, you're buying a piece of that company. What's interesting here is that in an ICO, it's just a new currency, right? So when Ethereum sold their, did their ICO, they basically sold currencies, a new cryptocurrency that they, I mean, I think a little bit tongue in cheek. Do you remember what they called it? Ether. Ether. Exactly. The whole thing is kind of, the whole thing is a little bit tongue in cheek, right? Because if anybody who knows anything about the internet and the connectivity is based on an Ethernet protocol, right, at some level. So the fact that they called this whole thing Ethereum and then that they called the currency, the coins that they issued Ether, it's kind of funny. But the idea, again, is that if that currency itself that gets issued is only purchased by like a small group of people, the the currency itself has no real value then, right? Hmm. Now, what they do is they have the base value of Bitcoin. So we'll kind of trade in unison with Bitcoin. But if that currency itself, if the Ether itself, in this case, Ethereum's currency, and we'll talk about other, so Ripple issued their own currencies as well. If that currency itself doesn't have sort of wide trading, so if it cannot be traded on every exchange, and even if it can be, if it's not liquid, meaning not a lot of people are interested in trading it, then the value of it is going to be hard to determine, even if it's associated with Bitcoin. And it's also going to be hard to move it around and use it for anything if that makes if that makes sense, right? So these these ICOs to me are really risky transactions because it's like so Brazil in my lifetime has probably reissued or revalued their currency twenty times. And what it meant was that if you held the Brazil real 
or whatever the currency was called in its multiple incarnations, right? So you never knew what it was going to be worth, even if it was based on the dollar, then massive inflation or massive deflation or the government itself defaulted on its debt. It meant that their currency used to swing around wildly and nobody wanted to hold it, which meant that no matter what the actual value, no matter what the sort of quoted value of it was, the real value was de minimis, right? Because nobody wanted to use it except domestically. And even domestically, there was a big hoarding of dollars. So you run into an, an, the same problem with an ICO because every time somebody issues a coin or a token, particularly, and we'll get back, we'll get to um, this company called Zipper Global in a second, right? Because what they're trying to do is also really interesting. But what the ETH, Ethereum guys did was they issued, I think it was like 20 million, 18 to 20 million dollars worth of Bitcoin in their own tokens, which they called Ether, hoping that that coin itself would maintain and hold its value and that people would want to trade it. So there's a little bit of an abstract concept there, but I think it's really important to note that when they, when a company like Ethereum sells or does an ICO, they're not selling ownership in their company. Right, they're just issuing a new cryptocurrency. They're just issuing a new cryptocurrency, and that cryptocurrency will behave in a way that's similar to Bitcoin, so its right. value will get stored on a blockchain. And in this case, that value gets stored on the Ethereum blockchain. And they're hoping, you know, and in the same way that, you know, France used to have the French franc and the Germans used to have the Deutschmark, but now there's just the euro. Ethereum is hoping that their currency will take precedence to Ripple's currency. What is it? XPR, XRP, I can't remember what it's called. And that other currencies that get issued by other companies, right? I think something like $500 million worth of um, ICOs have been done this year. So not small, but not huge. Right? It, particularly in the amount for the amount of currency that's um, in circulation, it's not a big number. Right. But there's also one of the problems with these ICOs is that because you don't own anything except a token that's associated with the value of something else, and that something else is not the company that's issuing it, right? Mm. Hey, so let me understand here, Michael, is that I'm trying to get my head around the Ethereum ICO. So basically, they go to the public or they go to their network of interesting people who've expressed an interest in what they're doing, and they effectively go through a process which is like a public offering, which is their ICO, right? But rather than yes. raise hard dollars or gold or Krugerrands or whatever, they're raising, they're generating the cash, the money in virtual currencies, right? So it's, it's trading one cryptocurrency for the other. And I guess a vast majority of the people who are buying into that ICO were crypto people, right? They were, Absolutely. right. So you've got this, and they, they've enjoyed a huge return on their, investments you know these these guys that bought a few bitcoins a few years ago are now sitting on thousands millions and they're pouring that back into these icos now which are, i guess is a big chunk of what's happening so i look at that and i wonder your thoughts on this so i look at that and i think that looks to me like a bit of a bubble because it's kind of in a i look at the stock market and i see right now all these companies issuing dutch you know like they're, they're selling bonds and they're borrowing money effectively at extremely low prices, and then they're using that cash to buy back their own stock and pump up the stock market. I see sort of a parallel there is that kind of like this money's just going round and round within this own system, creating this sense of growth where there is none. I don't know, hmm. am I being cynical here? What do you see? No, I don't think you're being cynical at all. I think at the, at the initial issuance of any new currency, which is what each one of these ICOs is, right? It's a the release of a new cryptocurrency. It's not Bitcoin itself. It's issued in relation to what the value of Bitcoin is because Bitcoin is the most widely accepted currency there is. Very similar to what the dollar is as a store of value, mm. but in the global currency. Um, the same way that gold used to be in the old days. Remember, gold doesn't really have any value except the value no. that you attribute to it. And I think Bitcoin is playing that role in the cryptocurrency space as well. And whenever I order, a, whenever I issue, excuse me, a new ICO, or a new cryptocurrency, it trades like on some basis or some discount to what um, Bitcoin is. And then it either increases or decreases in value depending on a bunch of different factors, one of which is liquidity, two is how many people really care about it, three is what's the confidence in the company that's actually issued it and the blockchain on which it trades and the prevalence of it 
globally for the people that can both trade it, use it, and have interest in it, right? And we'll get to this, why this is significant, like I said, sort of at the end of this, because I agree with you. There was a joke going around, okay, during the financial crisis back in 2007. It was, you know, one of these things we had to do to keep ourselves sane. And I think this is, <clears throat> you'll, you'll like this actually when I get to the end of it. Um, and the idea was this. A German tourist went to, um, you know, with 100 euros, went to London, okay? And he walked into a small inn in London and he said, look, I want to stay here, but I want to see what the rooms look like first. So I'll leave 100 euros on the table here, but can I just walk upstairs and see what the rooms look like on the second and third floor? And the innkeeper said, sure, I'll just take your money here. When you come back downstairs, I'll give you the money back if you're not going to stay. And if you are going to stay, we can use this as a down payment on your room for the next week or whatever it was, right? And while this German tourist went upstairs, and they use the Germans, right, because the Germans are the most fiscally conservative, they're the most fiscally responsible. The idea was that the Germans knew what they were doing with their money. Okay, and this was back in 2007. Anyway, and if I tell this wrong, please interrupt me, but I think I remember this properly. While the German tourist was upstairs looking at the room, the English innkeeper took that money and went next door and paid his dry cleaner. <laughs> the 100 euros. And the dry cleaner took that money and went next door and, you know, and paid his, uh, his auto repair guy. And the auto repair guy went next door and took that 100 euros and paid the air conditioning guy. And it made it all the way back around where like the guy who was buying the beer went back in and gave it to the innkeeper. And then the German tourist came downstairs and said, I don't think I'm going to stay here. Can, mm -hmm. I have my, can I have my money back? But that's the whole point. Is like I worry sometimes at the beginning because it's this, you know, who's the greater fool? This is the greater fool theory, right, is I issue an ICO. All my crypto friends buy it. Right. My crypto friends tell their friends who aren't initiated kind of into this secret society per se and say, oh, you should definitely buy some of this new Ether or some of this new Ripple or whatever it is. And most people don't understand what it is. And then if the market just disappears for that currency, again, just like the Brazilian real got revalued, you kind of don't know what you're holding yet. So, yeah, there is a ton of money to make in trading and issuing these securities. They're not really securities, but issuing these new currencies. But the question really is, are you getting scammed or not? And it's hard to tell if you are or if you're not, right? Mm. Because I think most people that are doing this are like uninitiated. Right. So it's hard to figure out it's hard to figure out what you're doing. Now a company like Ethereum is large, well funded, well technologized, and I don't think the Ether tokens or coins are gonna go away. Um and you kinda got the sense that you had confidence in that team from the beginning because they'd rolled out other products, they had a well thought out business plan, they were gonna try to disintermediate the entire market globally for contracts. That's a big deal. And I think they've actually gone on really well to go and do that right they want to be you said it they want to be like a world computer yeah they want to decentralize all of these things and that's starting to take hold and it's starting to take hold pretty quickly but again this is one of those things like where's the novelty factor for the things that are going to get built on top of their blockchain um and what's the complexity so mm. how fast is it going to get adopted right if it's right into this model that we had for tcp ip now, the other thing is you have – let's talk a little bit about how some of this stuff is being used, right? I mean we, we talked a little bit about the Ethereum and the contracts and stuff. Let's go more specific, right? So a company like Zipper Global is basically saying – this is a company started in Hong Kong this year. And basically what they're saying is do we really need venture capital in a world where the entire financial system is being decentralized? Mm. Right? So – this is kind of like crowdfunding on steroids to a certain extent, right? And basically what they're saying is, and they want to use something that Ethereum has started, and that is let the blockchain automatically trigger um, KPIs and sort of, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the KPIs and, and the, the accomplishments that are in any particular contract, right? In other words, once that, once that uh, milestone gets hit, the contract automatically executes and then either pays money or takes money or gives a service, right? That's one of the things that Ethereum wants to build. What Zipper wants to do is they want to disintermediate the startup um, funding system and say, you know, we're going to issue coins, Zipper coins and tokens, right, to fund the building of this business. And 
what we're going to ask people to do is to build this technology is we're going to build specific contracts for the startup world and startup funding that um, trigger automatically based on milestones and KPIs. So it's a very specific contract that's probably going to sit on top of the Ethereum blockchain, right? And it basically what it does is it gives investors early access and a safe way to invest in like other companies' ICOs. Does that make mm. sense? So, so like what would that company. be replacing that's out there already? So just so we can understand, put it in a box, what process would that be replacing that we're familiar with? Well, all of the all of the like constant due diligence and company reporting. So let's say you want to invest in a company, pick a company, XYZ startup. Mm. Right? And they say, okay, um, you can invest, let's just say a million dollars and we'll trigger a hundred thousand dollars of your funds every month for the next 10 months. And that money gets triggered based on a certain level of sales, but also on a certain level of profit margin. And that gets built into a contract that sits on top of Ethereum that gets verified by the blockchain. Does that make sense? It yeah. gets all the way to the blockchain. So you have money in in coins, in zipper coins or in dollars that are sitting in a place that automatically gets executed because you're believing in the basis of the blockchain that says it now gets verified based on these KPIs. It automatically executes. So there's none of this like you call the startup. I remember on the other side – because it's contract based, all the things that the startup do feed directly into the contract, right? And feed directly into the blockchain. So they can't not just lie, but they can't exaggerate, they right. can't over report, they can't over report, they can't do any of these things. So it's building, it's taking away this whole concept of potential risk and due diligence. You can invest in a startup that has big plans, but that goes to zero, and then maybe your contract never gets executed because the KPIs haven't been hit. It doesn't auto execute, and that money defaults back to you. It's an interesting concept, right? right. Because right, right well, now, when I see this, would, would that have been what the the VC would have done? I mean, to monitor those KPIs and decide when they were met. Would that would have been their role when they were sort of dishing out the money in batches over, you know, making sure that the startup hit the the milestones that they had agreed on? Would that would have been the VC's role up until that point? Well, yeah, or some junior analyst at the venture capitalist, or even the senior partner there, because. The idea is, let's just say, again, you're going to invest a million dollars and it's in three pieces, one third, one third, one third, right? You want to see, and it's over a nine month period of time. So you have the first three months, you've been kind of, you've been given financial projections, which frankly for a seed stage startup, we talked about this months ago, really just like licking your finger and putting it in the air and seeing which way the wind blows. You're really just guessing. But you put those into a contract, right? And and you tell the venture capitalist upon the... Um, milestones, hitting the milestones in these KPIs, you'll give us the next $333,333, right? And then when it comes to that time, the VC either is getting nervous or maybe their financial situation has changed or, or, or there's been an act of God. You don't know, right? And you come to that next point and they say, you know what? We're not going to fund the rest of it. But you planned on that. There was a contract that said it. But you can't execute that contract without forcing someone to do it, right? So that's what they're doing now is – there's all this constant negotiation process, right? And even, even a, a, an LOI, right, or a term sheet that gets signed, you can do this for a term sheet too. If you put that on the Zipper platform, essentially what happens is as soon as you sign that term sheet and put dates on it, that's going to automatically execute based on, at least at the beginning, probably on time. Within a month, you'll get this money. Within two weeks, you'll get the money. And then the rest of the contract is automatically um, starting, and then when you hit those KPIs or milestones, the rest of the contract automatically executes or doesn't, depending on whether you hit those KPIs. And remember, it's all managed on the blockchain. So neither you as the startup company nor you as the investor kind of get to decide. Right. It's completely objective. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because that... the blockchain is this distributed ledger of things. Yeah. In this case, a contract that just decides and auto-executes for you. It's a fascinating thing because there's no more of this what I call dithering, right? right. Hey, you said you're going to do $250,000 of revenue in the first quarter and you only did two forty eight. Mm. So you're not getting your money. And it seems a little silly. But you can build sort of um, – you, you can build margins of error into – like there's a whole bunch of things you can do. But I think that's their idea here is that they want to take away all of this sort of questioning and dithering. And if your financial situation has changed, too bad because you've already put your coins and your tokens 
into an account or on the blockchain and allowed them to auto execute based on this thing. It's a really interesting concept. And remember, this thing scales almost automatically, right? Because um, it, it can be anywhere in the world. And because the currency is not necessarily dollars or yen or rubles or whatever, it's just ZPR, whatever their currency is going to be. So there, can, there, there will be a consideration for companies like this to do ICOs as well. And it's just another use of, again, all the way to the beginning, the blockchain, um, this distributed ledger, using contracts for a completely new way of doing things. But again, it requires the, uh, the agreement of a bunch of different ecosystems to do it, right? So it fits into this, is it really novel? Yeah, it's kind of novel. And is it complex? Sure. And remember as well, once your money or your resources or your kind of value store sits on the blockchain, think about the frictionlessness, if that's even a word, of the transaction. It's you no longer have to go to a bank. This is where it gets really interesting. We didn't mm. even talk about stock settlement, which we should do, right, to show like where the friction is. But the idea here is that the blockchain is going to remove friction, particularly these newer blockchains where they have much higher throughput and much higher bandwidth in the sense that now to settle anything, you just have so many counterparties involved and so many levels of approval that have to take place and so many rules. Right? Right. This, is part of, this is part of the problem too, right? Know your, the KYC rules, the money yeah, laundering rules. Yeah. All this stuff, again, gets disintermediated. It gets back to the anarchy thing we were talking about earlier. And that is, this is just going to execute automatically. Once you put your store of value on the blockchain and your contract on the blockchain, it's either going to execute or not. But you've got to get everybody to agree that that's the case, right? Mm. Just going back to those, those, the limitations and the regulations, I mean, we're moving into an era which is completely unregulated, and it's only regulated by the wisdom of the crowd, so to speak, isn't it? By that democratic, anarchic force where you can see every single transaction published on the blockchain. Everything's got right. a trace. But, you know, you've got a whole bunch of uneducated, I suppose I, I use that, you know, in, in, in quotes, investors, you know, people who are more technology savvy than maybe they are investment savvy, involved in right. this scene, right? Right. I, I mean, we saw what happened with that DAO, DAO, DAO company, right? That sort of artificially intelligent hedge fund, which raised 150 million and then um, they some attacker found a flaw in it and just siphoned all the money off, right? I mean, that was... A, <laughs> That's just it goes to show how how vulnerable the whole thing is, right? So right, but this 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 is interesting, right? Though no, so perce and perception is nine tenths of reality, right? The the problem was not on the blockchain itself, right? The problem was on the application, so on the DAO app stuff that sat on top of the blockchain, and their ability to manipulate things that happened like prior, hmm. so that and and there's also again. There's computing power associated with what happens on the blockchain too, right? So as long as there is one person or one entity that has all of the computing power, they can potentially influence the next block, right? The previous blocks can't change. But if they can kind of force everyone to agree that a particular block is correct, then yeah, money can get stolen and assets can sort of disappear. Right. That has to get worked out, right? And this is this whole concept of if you look at the development of TCP IP, and again, it was like 30 – years 25 to 30 years before it was ubiquitous and i think things probably happen faster now than they did back in the 70s 80s and 90s but again the entire like range of services businesses governments banks everything's going to have to change we saw recently and i can't remember the name of it but a few of the large banks morgan stanley goldman sachs jp morgan Citigroup, got together they were going to support one protocol on the blockchain and then they said you know what it's not working mm. But that's part of the problem is that for some of those companies, it's better for them to keep their databases private rather than public because that's where some of their edge is. So right. if you think about – if you think about – and this is really like inside baseball and I had a whole section that I wanted to talk about like how a trade actually gets settled and then how that's going to change on, on the blockchain and maybe we can still talk about that a little bit. Right? But think about what proprietary trading is. A prop trader – at Goldman or Morgan Stanley or wherever says, I have all of this back data from all the trades that, that the exchange has done and that I've done in the past and I know what makes and doesn't make money based on some math and algorithms that I've built around that. 
and I do some backtesting analysis on it. But see, if all that data just sits on the blockchain somewhere, and if all of everybody's trades are available to everybody because it sits on a public blockchain, then what's the value of all that stuff from a prop trading perspective? Like it takes away the the edge. Right. There's nothing hidden, right? There's nothing that I can use against you as another trader. No, because we all have the same data. Right. Because now we have different data. There's the public data, which means everything that happens on an exchange. And if you're an exchange member, you pay for that data. So you get that data. But then you have all of your trades and all of your client trades. And that's different for everybody. Right, for every broker. So if you're going back and doing an analysis of all those trades, um, you're not necessarily going to have any edge if everybody has access to the same information. Mm. But think about it in a different realm. Okay? Amazon today has the best recommendation engine in the world. And the reason why is because they have the most transactions. It's just like a stock trade, right? And what they do is they go back and they build algorithm, algorithmic trades and algorithmic trading systems to go back and analyze all of the previous um, purchases and even the things that you've just looked at. That's how they can say to you, Graham, if you bought um, this movie, you're likely to buy this other movie. Because they know your tra- – but again, if that's all sitting on a blockchain somewhere, then they don't have the edge. That means that every e-commerce company then can potentially use that data and then Amazon loses their edge. So there's a big question as to how long it's going to take to get all that data out there on a publicly distributed database. You know, because I think until until there's benefits to everybody, there's going to be um, – there going to be people that are going to push back on mm. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, maybe mindset-wise, they're not set up for it as well. I mean, you, you mentioned the the investment bankers looking at the technology and then deciding they were going to back one and then backing out, right? Maybe yep. you know the DNA of those organisations isn't set up right, or maybe it's going to be a younger generation come through that get it. You know, that, I mean, it's like the old adage: is like when they first decided to build websites you know when companies first got onto the internet they were brochures you know the brochureware website right because that's how they kind of saw it and in the same way you know the same we all those kind of analogies like radio to tv it takes the younger generation who sort of grew up with a different paradigm if you like and it's the same with the internet isn't it that took that generation who got that to make it happen rather than people who just saw it as more of the same but or maybe on a bigger scale which is kind of maybe what the the old school investment and banking mindset is looking at blockchain and Bitcoin as, right? right? We can do this, but maybe we can do it faster or cheaper or have more scale with this, right? Whereas it maybe takes somebody to come into this and say, actually, we've got to look at this differently. And that's going to be interesting, isn't it? When somebody comes in with that. I mean, like these guys, I mean, you know what they're doing with Ethereum is like, you know, I would never be able to see that paradigm or that vision of what they're trying to achieve i wouldn't be able to look at it like that right they've come at from a completely different angle completely and that's exciting right i mean that's just blowing it away i think i think it's really exciting and you know for me the whole concept of a blockchain it, it can create what i'll call and what the harvard review also called foundational change right and that foundational change means and again, we kind of do this like, what does a day look like for an autonomous driving, an autonomous car or autonomous vehicle? What does it look right. like? You go through what that day is, right? Let's just go through the life of a person. The blockchain exists and everybody kind of accepts that it's okay to put all of your information in the public or it just gets mandated by governments globally, which I think is much more likely to happen. You're going to see governments start to create what they call digital identities. And those digital identities, if they sit on a blockchain, on the moment you're born, there's going to be some record of you on the blockchain. Graham Brown, right? Michael Wade's born July 1965. And that's like unchangeable. So your birth certificate now becomes irrelevant because it's just public knowledge, right? That's first off. Second of all, if you were from a country like the United States, your social security number's on the blockchain. It might be private, but it's there. It cannot be changed. It cannot be stolen, right? Because the entire system has to agree that it's not yours anymore so it can go away. That's, that's the beauty of this distributed ledger. That's good and bad, right? Mm. So now your birth date and your sort of identification number, at least in the US, your SSN, are now set in stone. But you cannot now have a fake passport because the entire universe of the blockchain has to agree on that distributed ledger that that's actually you and it's not. 
So the only people that will be able to do that are the CIA. I don't know what is it, the MI6. I don't know MI. I don't know what it's called. MI5. KGB. Yeah. MI5. Sorry. MI6 but, is the make believe James Bond one. Sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I probably got the CIA wrong too. They probably exist. Like but anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. But these are the people these are the people with the power to fake this stuff. I mean, I was curious, I mean, you were saying that though, but what I was interested in was that you know, you can't you can't fake the passport and you're also saying that my question was is you're also saying that you can't incur any kind of fraud in in the traditional sense, right? Because you can't then produce a social security number or a fake birth certificate and so on. Because it's all out there. Nobody owns it. But at the same time, you have to get the powers that be to agree to that, right? That's, yeah. That's, and that's kind of interesting sort of, they have to agree to that. But at the same time, they also benefit from that old school system that they hold on to that power, right? So I suppose it's the same with the investment banks, isn't it? It's like, I'm just wondering, you know, how that sort of turns out is that, the people that benefited from owning the information and, and siloing information will also lose out from this, right? So, so here's something that's interesting in the context of what's going on in politics in the United States, right? The, the Trump administration has asked every state to give them their, road, their voter registration data because they, they, they believe that in the 2016 election, somewhere between 3 million and 5 million people who either didn't exist or did exist, but like, voted in one jurisdiction and then voted in another jurisdiction that there was voter fraud. Hmm. So the government is highly incentivized to create a blockchain of unchangeable, right, uneditable data of your identity for voting purposes. Right, so the question is, maybe the blockchain itself then goes from being global, which is what it is now in a sort of anarchy way, and it goes into being sort of country by country again, and then maybe it's region by region. I don't know because I can't mm. see the future, but I can imagine a bunch of different ways that it can be used for both good and for bad. The question is, who's going to control it? And well, anybody, the, can anybody control it, right? That's the well, thing. That's I the mean, thing. it's built not to be controlled, really, isn't it? Decentralized. Yeah, it kind of is. But, but I, think the, I think the jury is out on what the real progression is going right, to be. Right, right, right. But okay. it's like, I mean, the whole internet, like the ARPANET was built for the purpose to withstand some kind of attack, right? That's how they built it. That if one of the nodes was wiped out, the whole internet would, the whole ARPANET back then would still work, right? That was the whole ethos. And it's the same with what's happening here, right? There is no central authority, so. Exactly. But the interesting thing about this is that in the old days, when the ARPANET got built, it got built by the US military and the US government. Right? right for the United States. Gotcha. But what's happening with the Ethereum blockchain, the original blockchain, is that it's built by a bunch of people you don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Ethereum, yeah. obviously, you know who it is, but the original blockchain, you don't know. So hey, how does it? Do Michael, I'm interested. If you were, if you were, you know, let's sort of rewind the clock a bit. If you were going in as a young trader into, let's say, a, a Morgan's or a Goldman Sachs or a Merrill's, if they're still around. If you were going into one of those investment banks today and starting your career and you were seeing all this happening, how would you, would you do things differently? Would you be open to new ideas? Would you, I, I know you're, you're sort of, you like the word disintermediation and disruption. Is there scope for it in these organizations? How would you behave in this sort of environment given what's going on right now? Well, so one of the things that I did a lot when I was at, uh, at work was, tried to understand how technology could be used to make things more efficient. That's just one of the things that we did, right? And I can get into the weeds really deeply about using the fixed protocol and all these other things that we did um, to make trading faster. We built matrices, which meant that doing the cost of doing the next trade was collapsing closer and closer to zero. So to the extent that you could either keep commissions constant or decrease them at a rate that was slower than the rate at which you could do more trades, you could make more money. And I believe that if I were in a similar situation today and that the blockchain was there, it's this, it would be no different in some respects than putting in a bunch of Linux servers, which meant that you didn't have to run Windows NT on the back end. You could buy Linux for free and then just buy service associated with it so you didn't have to pay for the software. And I think that anytime you can look at some transformational or foundational change on the software or even on the process side, I think you have to at least try to use it. And I'm very convinced that if I were in a similar situation today, 
as a junior person, whether in the back office, the middle office, or the front office, and I saw this stuff changing, I would do the exact same thing that I did in the past, and I was try to figure out how can I get the blockchain. You know, we went, we can go through this, right? But like, on a simple stock trade or a simple group of stock trades has to go through so many hoops just to settle, because mm. there there are too many. I don't want to go through it now because we've been talking for a long time. There's so many entities involved, and it's not just so the clients talk to the Talk to the um, the trading houses, which have memberships on the exchanges. That stock gets stored um, at an agent bank or a custodian bank. So now you've got four or five people on each side of the trade. And at every step of the way, they have to be confirmed and reconciled. And remember, all of those systems are disparate, which means that if a client of Goldman Sachs trades with a client of Morgan Stanley, first it has to be verified and confirmed with more internally, then with the exchange, then with the agent bank. And by the time, sometimes it takes three days to settle just to make sure that everything's okay. And then the money has to move. And even with all of these things being electronic, it still takes a lot of time. And part of the reason why is because the databases where all this stuff lives is private. Mm. Morgan has her own database. If you look at the top five agent banks or custodian banks, Mellon Bank, State Street, JP Morgan, Citigroup, BNP Paribas, they have the, all have their own systems. Right. So if State Street has to settle a trade in the back end with JP Morgan, that has to be verified. It just takes time. But imagine if it sits on a public ledger that's distributed. That trade could literally settle instantaneously if the system itself, so if the blockchain that was being used had the bandwidth to do it, because everybody would be sitting on the same system. So you talk about the efficiencies being built in and the productivity changing drastically. This is a perfect example of how that could be completely abstracted. Mm. You take away all of the middle sections, like what would you need a stock exchange for? And what would you need actually an agent bank for? All you would need is two people that want to trade. They'd place a trade into the ether for lack of a better term. And that trade just settles instantaneously. The money moves because money is no longer money. It's just value. And it's just entries in a public ledger. And as long as that ledger is not corrupted, which is unlikely, but even if it is, the whole system itself has to verify it. Right. As long as you can build that in technologically, because that's what happens today. When a trade gets settled today, somebody in the back office of Morgan Stanley calls somebody in the back office of Goldman Sachs and says, hey, we did that trade with you, 4,000 shares at 72. Yep, we paid 72 for 4,000 shares. Now, some of that happens electronically for sure. But you're still talking about two different systems talking to each other. They tried to do it with something called the FIX protocol, but your system internally had to talk to FIX and then FIX talk to each other. Hmm. The exchanges all had different. It's just, it's really interesting. But if there's a blockchain that's just distributed ledger, the whole thing changes. Wow. So it's more than just efficiency. It's real peer-to-peer securities emerging, right? I mean, that would, you may, maybe what we talked about earlier with Ethereum, we'll see some of that mindset shift up to the whole world of investing, right? Well, maybe they, they sort of come down that chain a little bit towards the world of Bitcoin, not technologically, but just in terms of the mindset shift, right? Yep. That, you know, as you say, all those middlemen, all those market makers, well, we don't need them anymore, right? And that's a big kind market. Of, kind of, because a lot of the work that they're doing is verifying, controlling, right, financial control, and, um, you know, just making sure that everything's right. So in the sense that the blockchain can do all that stuff automatically, you'd much rather have that happen, I think. Mm. Anyway. Look, let's talk about let's talk about an ICO. There have been some great ICOs out there. There have been some interesting ones. I just want to talk about an ICO that happened here in the region because I think it's <laughs> I think it's interesting, if that's okay. Let's I wanna end on this. I wanna end on this because you know, we talked a little bit about how Zipper's trying to change the way financings happen. And, you know, there are companies in Southeast Asia, we, you know, we always want to talk about tech in Asia, right, and how it's impact, how the rest of the world is impacting what's going on here. So Omise, which is a fintech startup based in Thailand, but wants to be regional, kind of like um, Stripe is, they did a $17.5 million um, Series B, I believe, a year ago. And, you know, I, I don't know why, but they're raising more money. So what they did was they went out and said they were going to raise $18 million in their own coin issuance. Mm -hmm. which I think is fascinating because it takes balls to do this, right? Basically what they're saying is they're doing an ICO. They want to create their own coin. So basically what they're saying is sitting on top of a blockchain, and I'm guessing it's going to be Ethereum, right? Is that they're going to issue their own currency. 
So they issued that current and, and, and believe me, they wanted to raise $18 million and they raised 25 like in a matter of minutes. So kudos to them. It means the ICO process works. But again, they sold the people that they sold it to don't have any equity in that company. Mm. Right. And they're basically doing it to fund the development of what they're calling Omise Go, which is a product that hasn't been released yet and probably won't be released until 2018. Um, if it if it if it does launch, right? So it's supposed to be based on the ERC20 token standard, right? But but the idea is that this is going to be something that's going to roll out in 2018. And then frankly, this is what we talked about before. You have to have faith in the fact that the platform that's issuing no, that currency, because it's like again, it's just like you know France or Italy issuing a new currency, right? Do you trust them to actually make their currency tradable and actually to roll out the products that they say they're going to roll out based on the money that they've that they've raised? And if their idea for raising this money is to um, is to kind of disrupt the banking system, which is a big kind of goal, it'll just be interesting to watch. This will be a bellwether to see whether this this um, ICO thing really works. I think some of the literature that's been written around this um, that says it's the first established tech company to date to do this financing. I mean, they're forgetting completely about Ethereum itself, which is also a tech company, um, and Ripple, which is also a fintech company that have already done this in the United States. So maybe they should be a little bit more careful when they're writing about this. But it'll be interesting to see as a bellwether for other ICOs in this region. But the question is, how many currencies do we need? Right. But he, is earlier. that is that the interesting thing though? I mean, you say it's not they're not buying equity. It's almost like a Kickstarter model, isn't it? Where you're sort of you're buying into a bit of the story and some of the product, right? Whereas there, I mean, there is equity crowdfunding now, but that came later on, didn't it? I mean, that was sort of a later development to the whole crowdfunding thing. Right now, we're seeing in the ICO space crowdfunding without equity, but maybe there will be equity. I don't know later on. But is that a problem? Do these people want equity? They just want coins. I mean, they just sort of no, get rid of one coin for another, right? They're speculating completely. And that's why I think this is really fascinating because they're not getting any equity in this, right? It's a crowd sale. It's not a crowd fund, right? It's right. very different. The point is that they just sold money. They just sold coins and tokens to other people. So now the, what they want to do is create an aftermarket for, that, for those tokens. And the real question is, like... Let's just say, because no startup itself is, is, is guaranteed success no matter how much run, money there is. I mean, look, Jawbone, which was a company with, that was yeah, super yeah. robust and sold real products, just went bankrupt last week, right, or this week. Yeah, yeah. That company had a valuation of $3 billion. And if I would said to you even a year ago, Jawbone, which makes you know, all these products and headsets and stuff like that, is going to go bankrupt, you would have just looked at me yeah. with like a strange, strange look on your face. Great products, yeah. Yeah, but there's, yeah, I have them, right? But there's, now there's a question is, what would have happened if Jawbone had issued an ICO? Yeah. Well, then what happens to that currency? Because then what's it based on? Who's going to manage it? It's like when a country goes bankrupt, what happens to their currency? Mm. It goes to zero. So it, I don't know. Is that a problem? That, is, that I think so. Because there isn't an aftermarket for the currencies? Because people can't readily trade their currencies into outside of the crypto world. I mean, you can, but it's not easy. That What they're doing is they're just kind of flipping them back into different currencies. And that's why these ICOs are booming, right? Yeah, and that's why it's so speculative, right? Because you don't know who's the next person or the next guy or gal that's going to buy that currency from right. you. In other words, if I said to you today, do you have more faith in, you know, pick a country, the currency of the United States or the, or the currency of Brazil? You, you could make that choice regardless of where what you choose. But it's the same thing for a cryptocurrency. Do you have more faith in the currency of Ethereum and Ripple or of Zipper, which hasn't really started yet, or Omise, which, you know, hasn't even built the product that they say they're going to build to, to do this. And that, frankly, haven't rolled out that many products in the last year at all. So the question is, what's going to be the value of that currency? And I think this is going to be a real problem for ICOs if this particular one doesn't work and stay robust, because people are going to get gun shy. Yeah. So the question is, you always want the best. When Ethereum does it and issues an ICO, it just it gives the market confidence in that new product, but you want to make sure that every that every next step, every marginal step along the way, is a better and better product and a better and better currency, right? That's why maybe Ethereum, the Ether, is maybe better than Bitcoin. It's not necessarily, but it could be, 
But what's going to happen to this currency, the OMGs? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't well, think anybody knows really. Well, if you hold it, you just got to wait for the next ICO to trade up, right? I think that's kind of like a lot of what's going on. Yeah, but again, you, now you start to deal with this this concept of comps, right? So comps means comparisons. And what I mean by that is you have to make a choice at some point, right? Do I hold euros or do I hold dollars? Yeah. They both buy things. They both have the same level of utility. But the question is, what's the value of that utility? And it's the same thing for a cryptocurrency. Do I want to own stock in Toyota or do I want to own stock in Isuzu? Mm. But if, if you were a guy who you know, happened to find that you had a big pile of Bitcoin, which you sort of, you know, you bought for a few bucks and now are worth thousands each, then you might just readily be not too worried about that, right? I know you say comps, but, you know, maybe if you're sitting on top of $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, you might want to sort of gamble that a little bit because it was all kind of, well... You know, it was all a bonus anyway. Maybe they forgot about it. I mean, there's plenty of stories like that. I mean, maybe maybe that's half the problem is that they didn't go yeah. into this investing and thinking, right, I want to get this return on investment. They just kind of bought Bitcoin back in the day and now it's worth a lot of money. So they're not too bothered if they lose a big chunk of that because they're still in the black, so to speak. Maybe, but we talked about this earlier, right? If you want this to be widely distributed and widely adopted, you're going to have to have products that everybody's going to want to hold. And that product, if that product's a currency or a cryptocurrency, and you're creating a bunch of them that nobody wants to hold in the end. So this gets back into that hype cycle. I yeah, always yeah. forget. But you know what I mean, right? Exactly. You know what I mean? I, I wish I could remember. I never can. I always look it up later. And then I always tell myself the next time I'm going to remember what it's called. And I don't. But you, you understand the concept. And that is at the beginning of any of these things, right? It's going to be like, you know, food delivery, web van. It's going to be on fire. And it goes all the way up to who knows what, a billion dollars. And then it goes to zero. And then it kind of crawls higher, 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 higher. And then you have... You know, and then you have Blue Apron or all of these, you know, you have Instacart. It just slowly rebuilds itself. So you'll yeah. see the same thing in the ICO market. If humans are involved. You'll get the same behavior. So today, a lot of these currencies that are getting issued are going to go to zero. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. And I wouldn't. And frankly, this falls into the category of that's a big surprise. I wouldn't be surprised at the, in the least if this Omise currency is one of the first ones to go to zero. Well. It's just my opinion, unsolicited. But my point is, like when a small company tries to issue these currencies, like who's going to buy it and trade it? Yeah. Well, now your opinion's out there on the blockchain, so to speak, in this podcast, so that yeah. everybody else can see you can't hide now. You've put your, no, yeah. you've nailed your colors to the mask. I guess any of our listeners as well, thoughts and opinions, they can tweet us, right? They can tweet us at Asia Tech Pod or hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. Follow us yep, on please. Facebook. Be really interesting to see what people are seeing in the world of cryptocurrency right now because there's so many things going on. We can't keep on top of everything. There's so many trends, so many developments, and there are technologies springing up left, right, and center. So it'd be great if people could tweet us and let us know what interests them at the moment and their thoughts on some of the things that we put out there tonight. Absolutely. And if we've gotten anything wrong, please let us know what it is. We'll get it right. All, all feedback to us would be great. Fantastic. And if you're watching this on the archive on Facebook, then please like the video and you can put in the comment section any of your feedback, thoughts, ideas on this discussion. Some of the things that you'd like to see discussed as well in future episodes. This is Asia Tech Podcast. Michael Waits and Graham Brown. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Michael. Have a good Cheers. evening. You've Thanks. been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.